Our second talk, our culture talk, uh, will be presented today by Embles Environmental Officer, Brendan Roos. He's only just joined Embles, he's only been in our organisation since March 2020. And prior to that, he spent 10 years as a sustainability professional in the UK in the public and private sectors. Uh, at Great Ormond Street Hospital, which is a famous children's hospital in London, he developed the their first sustainability strategy, which resulted in a 20% reduction in the hospital's annual carbon footprint and saved uh, them half a million pounds a year. And while there, he won a prestigious uh, Two Degrees Champions Award for Best External Communications Campaign, in which he promoted sustainability within the hospital's patients and visitors, including them in the development of the hospital's strategy. And then just prior to joining Emble, he worked for Landsec, which is the UK's largest commercial property company and is recognized as the most sustainable property company in Europe. Uh, while he was there, he led their, the company's energy and carbon program, reducing emissions by 28% and delivering a strategy to become a net zero carbon company by 2030. So I am delighted that he's joined EMBL recently and I hope he makes similar impacts within our organization. Okay, well, uh, thank you everybody uh, for taking your time. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, my name is Brendan Rouse. Uh, as introduced earlier, I'm Endel's first environmental officer. And it's a real honor to talk to you today about a topic that clearly I think is, is extremely important. So what I'm going to do today is lay out uh, the case for sustainable life science. I'm going to look at really work on both sides of the brain, the, the moral case for sustainability, and then looking at the right hand side of the brain, the logical case. Um, why is it important, even if we don't really care about the environment, what benefits does sustainability bring to our organizations? I'll then talk a little bit about EMBL's environmental strategy and the work that we've done to date. And we'll finish with uh, some sustainable science takeaway actions that hopefully everybody listening will be able to take back to their own uh, workplaces. So let's look at the moral case for sustainability. And we'll start by going back to the 1960s and this very iconic image. Oh my God, look at that picture over there. There's the earth coming up. Wow, is that pretty? Hey, don't take that from schedule. <laughs> you got a color film, Jim? Hand me a roll of color quick. Oh man, that's great. Oh, where is it? Quick. So, what you heard there were the astronauts on side, inside the Apollo 8 mission and the excitement that you can hear as they are rotating around the moon on their mission of taking pictures of the lunar surface. And suddenly the Earth appears in one of their small windows and they just have to stop what they were supposed to be doing and instead turn their cameras to take a picture of home. And this now famous image called Earthrise really started a movement. It did something to humanity. This was the first image that the people on Earth saw of the planet Earth alone in space. It made people aware that we live on a finite place. This is our spaceship. We can't, if we use up any resources that are on there, be it biodiversity, the natural resources, the habitats, we can't just create more of it. And if we pollute and destroy this place, we can't just leave. Now this earth has been habitable for mammals, fish, reptiles, and plants for hundreds of thousands of years. But fast forward today and things don't quite look so good. We know that we are facing a climate emergency. The chart on the left shows areas of the globe in 2019 which were either warmer or cooler than their average. And we can see the vast, vast majority of the world was warmer than average, and lots of areas in the darker red have, having their record warmth. In fact, 19 of the 20 hottest years ever measured with instruments have been since 2001, and the five hottest have all been in the last five years. And we know that prim the primary driver of this is anthropogenic carbon dioxide emissions, which brings me to the chart on the right. This is the very latest data from the Mualua Observatory, which is measuring atmospheric CO2 levels. And we can see that despite the fact we know that climate change is being caused by CO2 emissions, CO2 emissions continue to rise. 
Now, CO2 levels haven't been this high going back hundreds of thousands of years and multiple ice ages. What does this lead to? So this chart is taken from a reinsurance company called Munich RE, and it's really in their interest to know how many uh, extreme climate events are happening. And we can see from this chart quite clearly that in the last 10 years, the numbers of hydro hydrological and meteorological events is clearly increasing. These are events like floods and avalanches, hurricanes and cyclones. And these events are making areas of the world uninhabitable, driving population movements and disrupting food chains. As we can see here from Storm Alex, which hit Southern France and Northern Italy earlier this year, it causes massive damage to property, massive damage to infrastructure. Germany has suffered drought in 2018 and 2019. And this chart or this image on the left is a snapshot of the uh, water stress that German soils have uh, been uh, suffering in September of this year. And we can see that there's huge amounts of the German soil was in moderate, severe, extreme, and even exceptional drought. Now by the year 2100, what were one in 20 year heat waves will occur every other year. And this clearly has massive implications on our ability to feed the population. It causes a loss of biodiversity and increases the risk of forest fires. Our forest fires have also been increasing dramatically as global warming leads to longer and harsher droughts. Now these impacts are being felt around the world, but unfortunately and unfairly, the impacts are felt more in developing countries than those, uh, and, and even though they are least responsible for the damage. Along with climate change, lots of people are aware of the issue of ocean plastics. This image clearly shows how plastic waste is being broken down in, in waterways, leading to micro fragments that are now found throughout the food, uh, food chain. We also have an issue with biodiversity. It's in massive decline. We think we are witnessing the sixth mass extinction. And this one is being caused by human activity. So just as a massive meteorite hitting the Earth made the world uninhabitable for a large number of species at the end of the dinosaur era, we are making the Earth uninhabitable for large numbers of species. And being no doubt that for humans to thrive, we need to be inhibiting the Earth with lots of other thriving species. So that's a very brief look at the moral case for sustainability. But what about the logical case? What if actually people who don't really care so much about the environment, why do they still benefit from having a, a sustainable organization? And to answer this or to look at this, I'm gonna look through the private sector. And I'll start with this company called Orsted. Now Orsted is an energy company, which was last year named the world's most sustainable company. Now, Orsted used to be known as DONG, Danish Oil and Natural Gas, and it was set up in the 1970s to manage the Danish oil and gas reserves in the North Sea. In 2005, they also branched out and diversified and entered the electricity market. And for the next 10 years, they were an energy, gas and electricity company. But in 2015, DONG Energy had a deficit of 2.2 billion US dollars, which is a record loss for any Danish company. So what they do about it? Well, in 2017, Dong Energy sold off all of its natural gas and oil reserves. And it made the very ambitious announcement that it wanted to move to a 100% renewable energy company, the first energy company in the world to do so. They changed the name to Orsted because Danish oil and natural gas no longer fitted the ethos. And what's happened in the three years since? Orsted share price has increased by over 400%. They are now the largest operator of offshore wind farms in the world. And the thing is they are still an energy company that sells electricity. Their general business case hasn't really changed very much, but their focus on sustainability has paid off in a massive way. And there are lots of other examples in the corporate world 
where sustainable organisations have been outperforming non-sustainable ones. Looking at the amount of finance that's been invested in companies, we can also see a clear trend of money being moved out of unsustainable companies into companies that are listed on so-called ESG funds. These are funds made up of companies that are seen as having very high environmental, social and governance scores. So the question is, why do financial investors now want to move their money into these sorts of companies? And the answer is not that financial investors care more about the environment than they do about a solid rate of return. The reason is that they recognize sustainable companies are more efficient and have reduced costs. They have a better public image. They know that the workforce out there wants to work for these companies and they are aware of the risks. They have a very good risk profile. So the question is, do these uh, characteristics apply to our own research organizations? And of course they do. The more efficient we are, the less money we spend on energy and managing waste, the more money we have to spend on science and research. We rely on governments, philanthropists, funders to support us, to help enable us to do research. So a good public image is only gonna help in that regard. We want to attract the best young talent, the best researchers out there. And evidence is showing more and more, certainly with younger generations, that they want to work for organizations that share in their values. And finally, it's so important for us as well to reduce our risk, to be protected against volatile energy prices, new regulations, product availability, and having a protected reputation. So that's why I think sustainability is so important for research organizations. There's two really compelling cases there. So I want to now move on to talk about what we're doing at EMBL. And we are at the very early stages of our sustainability journey. This all started in January 2019, when the idea for a carbon neutral EMBL was first tabled during brainstorming for our next five year program. A Green EMBL working group was set up and in late 2019, the organization held its first Green Week. In March of this year, I joined as the organization's first environmental officer, and I've been working on an environmental strategy uh, throughout the lockdown. In the summer, I commissioned a piece of work called a materiality assessment, which I'll talk about after this, uh, to really help me to see what were the key environmental impacts or the environmental topics that we should be managing. And I will be presenting uh, the strategy up to now, later on this month, uh, internally. Now, Green Emble is motivated by the societal need to tackle environmental damage and driven by the passion of our staff. And the passion of our staff is so key. We still see this as a very much a bottom up uh, program. And this list here of, of ideas were brought to me in my first few months uh, at the organization. And I was really blown away with how enthusiastic our staff were for this topic. And they had so many great ideas. There is a slight problem though, when we have too much ideas and we would try to spread ourselves too much. We needed a way of identifying which topics were most important to us, where we should focus on. And there is a well-established method for doing this called a materiality assessment. So a materiality assessment is uh, seen as best practice in the early stages of developing a strategy. Its purpose is to identify the key impacts. It ideally should be carried out by a, an independent third party. And they do this through holding a range of interviews with internal and external stakeholders, as well as doing a desktop study. And the criteria that is used to measure the materiality of topics is the organizational impact. So how does that topic impact the organization, both in terms of reputation and finance, the interest that different stakeholders already taken on that topic and the impact the environmental impact that the organization has already. So we held 14 interviews with um, internal and external stakeholders. We wanted to cover people who worked across all of our sites or at least had responsibility for all of our sites, as well as researchers, 
and people who had shown a clear interest in this uh, area already. And we also spoke to uh, five external stakeholders, being Stadt Heidelberg, which is uh, the council where our headquarters in Heidelberg is based, the Francis Crick Institute, who I see as a bit of a leader in sustainable life sciences, the Wellcome Trust in UK R&I as large grant organisations, and also one sort of shown already a lot of thought in this area. And finally, um, Dr. Barbara Onazaga, who was a council member and also a member of our a German funder. So in the interviews that we held, all of their ideas, all of their thoughts about environment were included into a long list of issues. And we made the, all the different things, we put them into buckets with, of 10 kind of headline environmental topics. And you can see those on this chart here. So the chart is the result of the materiality assessment. And it shows um, these topics in the top right hand corner that are highlighted are the environmental topics that have the biggest organizational impact, stakeholders showed the biggest interest, and in the eyes of the consultant, EMBL has a big impact on. So we have employee behavior, quite obviously. The biggest organizational impacts they decided was the research and advocacy, so doing research about environmental issues and environmental protection. Transform, uh, performance and transparency. So are we reporting on our environmental impacts? Are we telling the good story and sharing our success? And then there's a number of operational things such as our energy use, our waste use, the emissions that come from our mobility, mobility, and then finally, sustainable construction. So moving forward, it's quite easy for me or it helps me to, to put these into now having three pillars of Green Emble strategy doing environmentally responsible research, doing environmentally relevant research and reporting and transparency. So that's as far as I've got to now and it's now a case of presenting this to our staff and getting their enthusiasm to join me and to help tackle these three areas. Now to finish off today's presentation, as I said, there will be some uh, sustainable science takeaways. Um, I will start by talking about freezers. So certainly minus 80 freezers, we should make sure that we keep those clear of ice, make sure that the seal is really uh, well maintained, disposing of old samples, and where possible, setting minus 80 fridges to minus 70. We should be looking at uh, powering our sites renewably, either through on-site renewable energy technologies or by moving to renewable tariffs working with our facilities teams to monitor how energy is used in our sites to identify areas of energy wastage um, and maybe changing set points where we are uh, over cooling in the summer or overheating in the winter. Laboratory um, behavior creates a huge amount of waste, single use plastics. So can we look at how we buy things into our labs? Can we reduce the amount of waste we generate? Can we reuse as much as possible? And where we can't do those two things, making sure that what's left over is recycled. COVID-19 has shown that actually scientists maybe don't need to fly as much as they did beforehand. We can work remotely very well. Uh, so as we come out of COVID, we should consider that and maybe not go back to uh, the curious days of lots of flights. We should eat less meat, so it has a huge environmental impact. We should push our canteens, uh, restaurants to serve more vegetarian options. And as a, at the very least, moving away from beef and lamb and pork to poultry. Making sure that there is incentive for staff to commute using active green travel. Yeah, that's through um, incentivizing financially or by making sure that there are at least the facilities to enable people to run or cycle to work. And finally, going back to my hero, Captain Planet and his tagline, the power is yours. I hadn't appreciated before I joined EMBL actually how much autonomy scientists have in how they run their own labs and their own behavior. With great power comes great responsibility. So just thinking about how you behave, making sure that your organizations have green groups and things like that is a great place to start. And I thank you for listening and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Brandon. Great talk and a very clear message that this is the time to act and there is so much for us to do. Uh, so speaking of uh, so much for us to do, um, 
let's start with the research labs because we all are research labs here. Uh, and as you pointed, rightly pointed, we generate a lot of waste and we also consume a lot of energy, uh, our ultra low freezers, fume hoods and what have you. So what according to you is the biggest challenge for labs to go green? Yeah, so um, freezers are obviously a huge thing. Freezers use a massive amount of um, electricity. So just making sure that they're well managed, that the, the temperature that they set to is appropriate, that the seals are, are good and it's clear of ice. Um, and just do a bit of research and just check to see if the samples that are in those freezers can be stored happily at minus 70. It doesn't need to be at minus 80 just because that's the, the temperature that the freezer could theoretically achieve. Other than that, fume hubs, like you say, are really important places. Leaving fume hubs running or the doors open just wastes energy, just keeps motors and fans running unnecessarily. And then it's very much down to the individual. So when we leave at night, do we turn off things like water baths? Are we, how, can we set up timers so that we don't need to leave things hot overnight just because we think we need five or 10 minutes in the morning that it would take for them to heat up? Uh, our time is so precious. Um, those are very kind of personal lab specific things. And then it's really working with facilities about um, how much air conditioning is really needed um, and, and, and making sure that the, the, the equipment or the mechanical systems, heating and cooling and chillers uh, are, are well maintained and, and, and modern. All right. Thank you. I, I, I really agree. All these little things that we could do on a daily basis, but in the grand scheme of things could add up and make a huge difference. Yeah. Um, our next question is from the audience. Lou Schaefer. Um, Lou, uh, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Sure. Um, one of the main ways you can tell if your organization is committed to sustainability is how much of a budget do they have for that? This is something we've been struggling with at HHMI, that people are all in favor of it. Well, you actually need a budget to get results to pay for carbon offsets or renewable power or other things. What's the status there at EMBL? Yeah, so obviously there's a budget for me. So uh, the budget for the environmental officer has been found in the central budget and I'm very grateful for that. Um, I think there's, there's obviously the status of our financing is difficult. Really, we are being funded to do science and, and, and how much of that should be allocated to towards sustainability. There are so many low cost and no cost things to be done in the first instance. And that is sort of behavior change, turning things off and making sure things like that are done. Then there's sort of commitments around when bits of equipment come to their end of life, are we committed to buying the most energy efficient version, even if it has a slight cost increase? Because we know that over the lifetime, it's going to be a saving. Um, the things around, so carbon offsetting, is for me uh, something that should be looked at after energy use has been reduced as much as possible. So reducing our carbon footprint before we offset it. Uh, and then renewable energies, I've had an amazing run in the last few years. Um, they are now the cheapest forms of energy um, on the planet Earth, solar and, and wind power. So then it's a case of looking at your suppliers and if they're trying to overcharge you for what is in effect the cheapest source of energy to generate, Look at other suppliers because there are suppliers out there that show there is no cost increase really for just wanting to be on a on a renewable tariff. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Luke. Thanks, thanks, Brendan. Uh, our next question is from um, Carl. Carl, could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, thank you for this very interesting talk, and uh, I'm, uh, it's it's good to see that uh, EM, uh, EMBL is investing. Um, um, uh, at least in, in hiring you and in, in taking this issue seriously, which, uh, you know, if scientists don't lead, uh, who will? Um, I, I really have one question, a comment. It's not clear to me that what you described really amounts to zero carbon plan. Uh, that's my question. My comment is that I, I'm not entirely sure I buy your argument on renewable energy. As you know, uh, I think we really should talk about low carbon energy. And as you know, in Europe, really the countries that have uh, decarbonized electricity sectors are mostly countries that have hydro and nuclear, okay? 
it's been a colossal failure on this in this case. There's a lot of renewables, but the CO2 emissions have barely dropped because of the intermittency and the absence of large scale uh, storage. So scientists here, this is my comment, also need to uh, really, uh, uh, you know, kind of be uh, rational uh, on this front. But anyway, so uh, my question is really, does this amount to a zero carbon plan, the, the, yeah. the kind of the steps that you have uh, outlined there? Yeah, so, so the, there is a statement, um, I think I mentioned it. So a carbon neutral amble first tabled at this, this brainstorming for the new program. Um, a carbon neutral organization is, is really what we should all be aiming for. Um, the Paris Climate Agreement and, and uh, for those who know this desire to keep global warming to one and a half degrees. Now, the, the global carbon budget needs to be half of what it was in, uh, in, in 2018, I think by 2030. So we're in now a decade of having to halve our carbon emissions globally. And we all can't offset our way out of, out of that. So any credible carbon neutrality plan has to state we want to reduce our footprint by a certain amount. And if it's in line with climate science, it should be saying we need to half our carbon footprint by 2030. And then we will look at offsetting the remainder. Um, on, I mean, as far as science goes, I think science has a bit of an issue here that we don't necessarily have uh, typical customers and we don't necessarily have shareholders and stuff like that. So the drivers for sustainable science really are very much within the scientists and within the community. There aren't so many external pressures pushing this. And why in my, what I've seen, actually the corporate sector and companies, some companies anyway, are much further developed in this journey than scientific organizations. Uh, so I think there's a huge opportunity here. I'm so grateful that, that Embel has started and has brought me in, but I think, and that's one of the reasons why reporting and transparency was rate, ranked so highly by the consultants, because they also, having looked at this, appreciated that it, they, this industry, this sector needs some front runners here to really set ambitious targets, to start telling the story, to try and bring other organizations along with them. Uh, I don't have a follow-up question. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Brendan. Um, and everyone, in the interest of time, I'm afraid that was our last question. So we will have to close the session with that. But then this discussion can certainly continue. To continue the discussion, please head to the Slack channel. You should have received an invite in the chat box. Our speakers will be there to answer your questions or to continue any discussions that you'd like to have. Uh, on behalf of life sciences across the globe, I'd like to thank our participants today, Joe, Jan, and Brendan for the insightful talks and the discussion. Uh, thanks also to the audience for joining us today and for participating in, this, in our discussion. Next week, life sciences across the globe will be at our sister institute, IDM Cape Town, hosting speakers Amroy Swankam and Intan Loyola. Do join us and until then, bye and uh, be safe.